Have you ever wondered why some countries grow rich while others stay poor? Or why entire industries can boom and then suddenly collapse, even when everyone's working hard? Here's what nobody tells you. The answer isn't about natural resources. It's not about intelligence or work ethic. It's about something far more powerful that most people completely overlook. Credit. The ability to borrow money and spend it today with a promise to pay it back tomorrow. And once you understand how credit actually shapes the entire structure of an economy, you'll see the world completely differently. Because credit isn't just about getting a loan or using a credit card. Credit is the invisible architecture that determines whether economies thrive or collapse. Let me paint you a picture. Imagine two farmers. Both have land, both have seeds, both work equally hard. Farmer one has no access to credit. He can only plant what he can afford with the money he has today. Maybe he plants one acre. He harvests, he sells, he earns a little money. Next year, maybe he plants one and a half acres. Farmer two has access to credit. He borrows money. He buys a tractor. He plants 10 acres. He hires workers. He harvests way more. He sells. He pays back the loan with interest. He still has profit left over. Next year, he borrows more. He plants 20 acres. Same starting point. Same intelligence. Same work ethic. But completely different outcomes. That's credit at work. And what's true for these two farmers is true for entire economies. Here's what's really happening. Credit allows people and businesses to pull future income into the present. To invest before they've saved. To grow faster than their current resources would allow. Without credit, you can only do what you can afford today. With credit, you can do what you'll be able to afford tomorrow. That difference is everything. Think about it. Almost nothing in our modern economy would exist without credit. Your house? Most people borrowed to buy it. That factory in your town? Built with borrowed money. That new restaurant downtown? Opened with a business loan. Even governments run on credit. Roads, schools, hospitals. Most were built by borrowing against future tax revenue. Credit doesn't just enable transactions. It shapes what gets built, who succeeds, which industries grow, and which die. It determines the entire structure of how an economy operates. And here's the really important part. When credit is flowing freely, economies expand rapidly. When credit dries up, everything contracts, jobs disappear, businesses close, dreams die. Understanding this changes everything about how you see the world. The first way credit shapes the economy is what I call the acceleration effect. This is the most obvious, but also the most powerful. Credit allows things to happen faster than they otherwise could. Here's how it works. Without credit, growth happens at the speed of savings. You earn money, you save some. You invest your savings, you earn a return, you save more. It's slow, linear, steady. With credit, growth happens at the speed of opportunity. You see an opportunity, you borrow money, you invest immediately. You capture the opportunity before it disappears. The returns allow you to pay back the loan and still profit. Think about starting a business. If you had to save up all the money first, it might take you 10 years. By then, the market might have changed. Competitors might have filled the gap. The opportunity might be gone. But with credit, you can start today. You borrow $50,000. You launch. You learn. You adjust. You grow. Within a few years, you've built something valuable. You pay back the loan. You're ahead. That business created jobs. It served customers. It paid taxes. It contributed to the economy. All because credit made it possible to act quickly. This acceleration effect compounds across an entire economy. Thousands of businesses starting sooner, millions of homes being built faster, infrastructure projects happening now instead of decades later. The difference between an economy with good credit systems and one without is staggering. It's the difference between countries that develop rapidly and those that stay stuck. The second way credit shapes the economy is what I call the risk distribution effect. This one's fascinating because credit doesn't just speed things up. It changes who takes risks and how those risks play out. Here's the thing. Every economic activity involves risk. Starting a business might fail. Building a factory might not pay off. Developing new technology might not work. Without credit, individuals bear all the risk with their own savings. If you invest your life savings and fail, you're wiped out. That makes people incredibly cautious. Too cautious, actually. 
With credit, risk gets distributed. You borrow money from a bank, the bank borrowed from depositors. The depositors are spread across thousands of people. If your venture fails, you lose some, the bank loses some. But no single person is destroyed. This distributed risk allows society to take bigger bets, to try more things, to experiment more. And that experimentation is where innovation comes from. Think about tech startups. Most fail, like 90% fail. But the 10% that succeed create enormous value. They invent new products. They generate jobs. They change how we live. Without credit, investors would need to risk their own money on ventures with a 90% failure rate. Very few would do it. We'd get way less innovation. With credit, venture capitalists use borrowed money to fund hundreds of startups. Some fail. Some succeed spectacularly. The wins more than cover the losses. Innovation explodes. But here's where it gets tricky. This risk distribution is powerful when it works, but it can also hide problems. When risks are spread out, it's harder to see them accumulating until suddenly they all blow up at once. We saw this in 2008. Banks lent money for mortgages. They bundled those mortgages into securities. They sold those securities to investors around the world. Risk was distributed everywhere until too many mortgages defaulted. Suddenly, the distributed risk became a distributed disaster. The entire global financial system nearly collapsed. So, credit's risk distribution is a double-edged sword. It enables progress by making big bets possible, but it can also hide systemic fragility until it's too late. The third way credit shapes the economy is what I call the inequality amplifier. This one makes people uncomfortable, but it's crucial to understand. Here's the reality. Credit is not distributed equally. Some people get access to cheap credit easily. Others get expensive credit or no credit at all. And this unequal access to credit shapes who gets ahead and who falls behind. Think about two people trying to build wealth. Both work hard, both save diligently. Person one has good credit. They can borrow at 4% interest to buy a house. The house appreciates. They build equity. They can borrow against that equity to invest in other things. Maybe start a business. Maybe buy rental properties. Their wealth compounds. Person two has poor credit. They can't get a mortgage. They rent. Their rent goes up every year. When they need money for an emergency, they use a credit card at 20% interest. Or worse, a payday loan at 300% interest. They fall further behind. Same work ethic. Same intelligence. But completely different trajectories because credit access shapes who can build assets and who stays trapped in cycles of debt. This plays out at a larger scale too. Rich neighborhoods get investment because banks willingly lend there. Business is open. Property values rise. More investment follows. Poor neighborhoods can't get credit as easily. Banks see them as risky. Businesses don't open. Properties deteriorate. The cycle reinforces. Credit doesn't just reflect existing inequality. It actively amplifies it. Those with access to credit can leverage it to grow wealth faster. Those without access stay stuck or go backward. And here's what makes this particularly insidious. We often think of success as purely about hard work and smart decisions. But access to credit is a massive invisible advantage that shapes outcomes. Two people can make identical decisions, but the one with better credit access will likely do better. Not because they're smarter, not because they work harder, but because they can borrow money more cheaply to invest in opportunities. The fourth way credit shapes the economy is what I call the boom and bust cycle. This is where things get really interesting because credit doesn't just enable growth, it creates inherent instability. Here's why. Credit is based on optimism about the future. When times are good, people are optimistic. They borrow more, they invest more, they spend more. The economy grows. That growth makes people even more optimistic. So they borrow even more. Prices rise. Asset values increase. Everyone feels wealthy. More borrowing follows. This is the boom. Credit expands. The economy surges. Jobs are plentiful. People feel rich. Everything seems great. But here's the problem. The boom is built on borrowed money. At some point, debts need to be repaid. And when something disrupts the optimism, everything reverses. Maybe a shock hits, a pandemic, a war, 
an oil crisis. Suddenly, people get scared. They stop borrowing, they start saving, they cut spending. Businesses see demand drop. They lay off workers. Those workers cut their spending. Demand drops further. Asset prices fall. People feel poorer. They cut spending more. This is the bust. Credit contracts. The economy shrinks. Jobs disappear. Everyone feels poor. Everything seems terrible. And here's the cruel irony. The bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. Because the more debt that was taken on during good times, the more painful the deleveraging during bad times. This boom and bust cycle isn't a bug. It's a feature of credit-based economies. Credit naturally amplifies both upswings and downswings. When times are good, credit makes them better. When times are bad, credit makes them worse. We've seen this pattern repeat throughout history. The Roaring Twenties led to the Great Depression. The dot-com boom led to the dot-com bust. The housing boom led to the financial crisis. Every time, the pattern is the same. Optimism drives borrowing. Borrowing drives growth. Growth drives more optimism. Until something breaks. Then the whole process reverses catastrophically. The fifth way credit shapes the economy is what I call the power concentration effect. This one's subtle, but it might be the most important of all. Here's the thing. Credit creation is controlled by a small number of institutions. Banks, central banks, financial markets. These entities decide who gets credit, how much, and at what price. That gives them enormous power over the entire economy. They can direct resources, they can pick winners and losers, they can inflate or deflate entire industries. Think about it. If banks decide they like real estate, they lend more for real estate. Housing prices rise, more real estate gets built. The real estate industry booms. If banks decide they don't like manufacturing, they lend less for factories. Manufacturing shrinks, jobs move overseas, entire regions decline. Banks don't do this with malicious intent. They're following incentives, lending where they think they'll get repaid, avoiding where they see risk. But the cumulative effect of millions of lending decisions shapes the entire structure of the economy. Which sectors grow, which shrink, where prosperity flows, where it dries up. And here's what's really significant. Central banks have even more power. They control the cost of credit for entire economies. When they lower interest rates, borrowing becomes cheap. Credit expands, the economy booms. When they raise interest rates, borrowing becomes expensive. Credit contracts, the economy slows. A small group of people at the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, they make decisions that affect billions of lives. They shape whether you can get a job, whether your house increases in value, whether your retirement savings grow or shrink. That's concentrated power, and it's a direct result of credit being the foundation of modern economies. But here's what nobody wants to admit. This system is fragile in ways most people don't understand because credit is built on confidence, on trust, on the belief that debts will be repaid, on the faith that the system will continue working. When that confidence cracks, the entire structure can collapse and it can happen fast, terrifyingly fast. We saw this in 2008. Suddenly, banks didn't trust each other. They stopped lending. Credit froze. Within weeks, the global economy was in freefall. Governments had to step in with trillions of dollars to keep the system alive. Because if credit stops flowing, modern economies simply don't function. Think about that. Our entire economic system depends on continuous lending, on constant debt creation, on perpetual confidence that tomorrow will be better than today. That's both remarkable and terrifying. Remarkable because it's enabled unprecedented prosperity. Terrifying because it's inherently unstable. Let me tell you about two business owners. Both had similar dreams. Both worked incredibly hard, but their stories ended very differently. First, there's Carlos. Carlos started a construction business in 2005. The economy was booming. Credit was easy. Banks were practically begging him to borrow. So Carlos borrowed big. He bought expensive equipment. He hired a large crew. He took on massive projects. He leveraged himself to the maximum. When things were good, Carlos looked like a genius. His business was growing fast. He was making good money. He felt successful. Then 2008 hit. Credit dried up. Construction projects stopped. Carlos couldn't get new loans to cover his expenses. He couldn't sell his equipment because nobody was buying. 
Within a year, Carlos lost everything. His business, his equipment, his savings, even his house. He declared bankruptcy. Carlos wasn't stupid. He wasn't lazy. He made decisions that seemed rational at the time, but he didn't understand how dependent his success was on the flow of credit. When credit stopped, his entire business model collapsed. Now let me tell you about Linda. Linda also started a business around the same time, a small accounting firm. Linda used some credit, but she was conservative. She didn't borrow more than she absolutely needed. She grew slowly. She built up reserves. She always assumed things could get worse. When 2008 hit, Linda's business slowed down too. Some clients couldn't pay. New business dried up. It was tough. But Linda survived because she wasn't over leveraged. She had cash reserves. She could weather the storm. And when competitors went bankrupt, she picked up their clients. By 2010, Linda's business was stronger than ever. Not because she was smarter than Carlos, but because she understood that credit cycles turn, that what goes up comes down. That leverage is a double-edged sword. The difference between Carlos and Linda wasn't character. It was understanding. Here's what most people don't realize. Credit isn't just a tool you use. It's the foundation that your entire economic life sits on. When credit is flowing, opportunities abound. Jobs are plentiful. Assets appreciate. Everyone feels wealthy. It's easy to succeed. When credit contracts, everything reverses. Opportunities vanish. Jobs disappear. Assets deflate. Everyone struggles. It's hard to survive. And the crucial insight? Individual decisions matter far less than the credit cycle. You can make smart choices during a credit contraction and still fail. You can make dumb choices during a credit expansion and still succeed. This isn't about fairness. This isn't about what should be. This is about what is. The economy isn't a level playing field where the best and brightest always win. It's a credit-driven system where timing and leverage often matter more than talent or effort. Understanding this changes how you should think about everything. Your career choices, your investment decisions, your debt levels, your risk tolerance. When credit is expanding, you can take more risks, borrow to invest, leverage opportunities. The rising tide will lift your boat. When credit is contracting, you need to be defensive. Pay down debt, build reserves, avoid leverage. The falling tide will sink the unwary. The successful people aren't necessarily the smartest or hardest working. They're the ones who understand the credit cycle, who position themselves appropriately, who don't fight the current. Credit shapes the structure of the economy in five fundamental ways. The acceleration effect speeds up growth. The risk distribution effect enables innovation. The inequality amplifier determines who gets ahead. The boom and bust cycle creates instability. The power concentration effect gives control to a small elite. These aren't separate phenomena. They're interconnected. They reinforce each other. They create the world we live in. And here's what this means for you. You can't opt out of the credit economy. You're in it whether you like it or not. Your job depends on it. Your savings are denominated in credit-based currencies. Your future is tied to its stability. But you can understand it. You can see the patterns. You can recognize where you are in the cycle. You can make decisions accordingly. When everyone's optimistic and borrowing like crazy, that's when you should be cautious. When everyone's terrified and refusing to borrow, that might be when you should be aggressive. The crowd is almost always wrong at extremes because the crowd doesn't understand that credit drives everything. They think prosperity comes from hard work and good decisions. Those help, but they're not enough. Credit access and credit cycles matter more than most people ever realize. They shape industries, determine winners and losers, create booms and busts, and concentrate power in ways that are mostly invisible. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. You'll notice when credit is expanding or contracting. You'll understand why some people succeed easily, while others struggle despite working hard. You'll recognize the fragility beneath apparent prosperity, and that understanding becomes your edge. Not a guarantee of success, but a framework for navigating a credit-driven world that most people don't even realize they're living in. The question isn't whether credit shapes the economy. It absolutely does. The question is whether you understand it well enough to protect yourself from its excesses and benefit from its opportunities. Because in a credit-based economy, knowledge isn't just power, it's survival.